Hello, this is Ipo Sword, and today we're going to be talking about this. A German Lionhead Artillery Officer's Sabre from around 1900 to 1937. This particular sabre was in fact a presentation sabre given to someone for long service. It has a dedicated panel that we'll look at later, which gives us the exact details of that. However, having said that, I do not know who owned this particular sword. I can only work off of their initials. Having said that, let's take a look at it from both a martial perspective and from a design perspective. It has a very typical form for one of these sabers, having a stirrup hilt, a lion head, ruby eyes, and a slightly swelled grip. The grip itself is made of celluloid over wood and features a brass wire wrap. The hilt furniture is also made of brass. You can't see it from that distance, but it has a inscription here with the initials, which is mimicked here on the back strap. And on the other side, it would have had some sort of decoration. This could have been a facsimile of a medal, it could have been a Nazi symbol later on in history, or it could have been something like a pair of cross cannons, which I suspect is what was on this particular sword. The scabbard has a simple one ring suspension with a small extra ring on the front here, for mounting it in some sort of frog, for example, for a mounted artillery officer. It has a very slender blade, being only around a centimetre and a half wide, and only about five millimetres thick at the base. The blade is nickel coated, etched, and blued. We'll look at the panels in detail over at the table in a minute. But let it suffice to say that this is one of the rarer examples of this type. Very few of these Lionhead artillery sabers actually have dedicated blue panels, and even fewer of them have an actual image on them. In this case, we have an artillery train. From a martial perspective, these were simply dress swords. They were never intended to be used in anger. And as a result, this is a very light, flexible, and lively feeling sword. It has only around a 5mm thick blade at the spine, which tapers down to only around a millimetre thick here in the foible. It is therefore very light, weighing only around 640 grams. However, its predecessor, the earlier dove-headed artillery sabres, and in fact the really early stirrup-hilted sabres, were very serious combat swords. The earliest stirrup-hilted sabre that comes to mind is a 1796 light cavalry sabre, which was successfully used for quite a while and turned into many variants. The stirrup hilt, referring to this extended part of the hilt here, was a uniquely British invention that was soon adopted across the world. In fact, in 1811, the Blucher sabre was adopted by the Prussians, Blucher being the name of one of the generals. The Blucher Sabre was in fact a copy of the 1796 British Light Cavalry Sabre, and it also featured one of these distinctive stirrup hilts. Over time these became less and less functional before they achieved this final ceremonial form factor. You'll note that I can run my hands along this without any fear of being cut, as it hasn't been field sharpened, and I doubt any of this particular type would have been. The stirrup hilt being talked about, let's have a little look at the way the hilt is made. When we go to the table you'll be able to see this more clearly. However, you can see a small crack has formed here and the celluloid has fallen off, showing the wood un underneath. Celluloid was one of the earliest plastics, and in fact this one would have been heat formed to the wooden ridged surface of the undergrip, and then the wire was bound in to make sure it formed properly. Some of these, where the wire has come off, still show the grooves of where that heat forming occurred and the wire was pressed in. I've not been able to discern who owned this particular example, the GL, who was an artillery officer. However, we can assume that he was rather old at the time the sword was given to him, as it was given to him for service between 84 and 37, that being 1884 and 1937. He would have therefore been a very long-serving officer, probably someone fairly highly ranked. That also concurs with the double-etched design with the blue panels. 
Let's take it over to the table and have a look at all these details I've alluded to, as it is really quite a pretty sword, if not the most functional in war. Here we can see the lionhead for which lionhead sabers are named. You'll note that it is integrated with the back strap and attached, however not connected completely, to the front quillon and knuckle bow. The ferrule here has fared best out of all of the pieces in terms of retaining its gilding, for whatever reason, probably due to the fact that it has rather fine and textured surfaces on it which adhere better to the gilding. You'll note that the eyes are glowing dully red. This is because these swords used cut and inset rubies for their eyes. You can see here the grip shining a rather lustrous black which was made of celluloid and hot wrapped with wire. This is a very thin layer, only around half a millimeter thick and is placed over a wooden core. You might not be able to see it, but the emblem here says GL. On the reverse side, we can once again see a, uh, a langet here, which is, as previously mentioned, missing its emblem. And we can see a continuation of the line head here and on the quillon here. If I bring the camera closer, I'll attempt to show you the celluloid with a wood panel underneath. I'm not sure how well you can see it, however, this area here is clearly wood, at least in person whereas everything beyond that point is covered in celluloid. This shows us both the thickness of the celluloid, which is very thin, and the fact that it was only a layer of celluloid. Some much later swords had full grips made of plastic, something in the form of nitrocellulose. However, this is one of the uh, earlier ones using just a thin layer of plastic, as it was at the time a very expensive material. Moving on to the blade, let's have a look at the blue panels. The blue panel you can see here says Gev vom Stampersonnel. I think this means Gevi de Met von Stampersonnel, or rather, gifted or presented by the Stampersonnel. Stampersonnel, or the Staff Administrative Personnel, is the uh, administrative system that organizes all of the army, and in this case the artillery too. You can see that it was from the 17th of the 7th in the year 84 till the 27th of the 1st, 1937. This would have likely been a long service gift rather than being for someone who died as there's really no purpose presenting them with a sword. The etching is not in the greatest condition here featuring some spotting of rust. However, it is clear that it was etched after the nickel was coated, as there is a dull appearance to it. On the reverse side, we can see the aforementioned blued artistic panel, which features an artillery train. Here you can see horsemen, including one brandishing a sabre, and here you can see a cannon being dragged behind them. This imagery seems much more suited to his early career than his later career as this sort of cannon would have been used in World War I versus later on. Therefore we can assume that until World War II they did not change their panels, as these are very different in World War II. This interwar sword thus provides an interesting historical example of the artistic changes between early and late sabres of the 20th century. Continuing our look at the artistry, you can see an oak leaf decoration on the knuckle bows there, and you can see the red glowing eyes of the rubies on the lion head. It's almost impossible to show on camera, so I'm not going to attempt it, but underneath this langet it says WKC and it has a knight's helmet. WKC was a Solingen manufacturer that existed throughout almost 200 years and is still to this day producing swords. You can get a dress sword from them if you'd like, I'll leave a link in the description. However, I personally find these antiques much more intriguing. That's all for today. Until next time, stay sharp.